We're recording. All right, hello everyone. My name is Claire Patton and I'm with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Project. I'm here with Mrs. Patricia McDonald who goes by Patty. Today is November 17th, 2020 and we're meeting via Zoom. How are you doing? I'm well, Claire, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so what year were you born? 1929. <laughs> And where were you born? Here in Oklahoma? Yes, I was born in Enid, Oklahoma. Okay. And that, yeah. was, uh, that was during the time that my family was moving around. My young, my young mother and father were moving around a lot because it was just before the Depression, but times were pretty hard down in, in Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> um, what did your parents do for a living? Dad was a traveling salesman, and um, he sold um, for Sunshine Biscuit Company, uh, cookies and, and some candy, I think, too, but mostly cookies. So when I was growing up, I had all of the sweets that I could, that I could possibly want. Therefore, I never really developed a t a, an appetite for them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's good, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And uh, mother was a homemaker most of those years. But uh, later in their in life, her life, um, when my brother was still a little uh, uh, a teenager, my dad had a serious illness and could not work anymore. And so she then invented herself as a secretary and worked for the Air Force, okay. uh, muted about 30 miles each way each day yeah. for a number of years and sort of kept the family afloat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what year did she become a second secretary? Was this in the 30s or? Uh, I'm going to have to calculate that. My, my younger brother is 11 years younger than I am. Oh, wow. And so he was a teenager. He was born in 42. Okay. Well, that'd be 50s. Yeah. Early 60s. Yeah. For that period of time, she worked um, not long enough to retire. So that means not 20 years, but at least 15 years, I think. Yeah. Did she enjoy being a secretary? Not particularly, um, but she was good at it because she was always so organized. Yeah. And um, she always had good. Uh, writing skills and typing skills and things like that that she had gotten in high school yeah so um, uh, it was not a career choice it was a family choice a, a need yeah. <laughs> to keep the family afloat hard times <laughs> yeah <laughs> where did you and grow I, up at? oh go ahead uh, I grew up really um, as I said in the early days of my family when I was a little girl um, we, they moved around quite a bit and, um, um, from Muskogee and dad tried his hand at farming on the side. Um, he, he would sell cookie, uh, cookies on, on the weekdays and farm on the weekends and until, but it just really never worked for him. Yeah. And, um, then we, we were, his route was such that he needed to be in southeastern Oklahoma at Hugo. Uh, and Hugo was a really, the, the, that's where my roots were, I think. And yeah. all my early experiences were in Hugo. I didn't leave there until I was a senior in high school. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like growing up during the Depression? Well, I... I always refer everybody to read To Kill a Mockingbird, yeah. um, that, that um, great American novel. Mm -hmm. um, my, my hometown was a little more advanced than deep Alabama, but uh, it was very much like that. And I was the tomboy who um, loved to play uh, sand, a sandlot <laughs> games, um, yeah. um, pole jumping, and even as a little kid, I always wanted to be in the middle of what all the neighborhood kids were doing. So it was, it was a great way to, in many ways, for 
um, a child of the middle class, and that was the middle class, even though times were hard, that's all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to grow up because I had so many wonderful opportunities there yeah. to just uh, natural um, opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> what, I mean, what do you remember, you know, eating and wearing in, since you grew up in the Depression? Or how was that, how was the way you grew up? Did you realize when you were older that it was different? No, it was all I'd ever known. And nobody had any real spending money. Uh, mm -hmm. Aside from, we always had a nice house to live in. Yeah. And um, the a, a gang of friends in the neighborhood, there were always young people around and doing interesting things. And I was right in the middle of it. Um, I never knew a time when I had a need for anything, clothing or food or anything else. It was, it was always there, yeah. but back on it now. And it was, a uh, there were no frills or, but, um, it, we just had a good time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you were an only child during that period. Yes, and a high-tempered one at that. I, there, <laughs> when I was a, a, a little a girl, preschool, I had a bad, bad temper and um, that was pretty well unchecked. And mother, I would hold my breath until I would turn blue and then I would fall over. And mother just knew I had a terrible um medical problem and she took me to the family doctor and I he gave me a going over and he said there's nothing wrong with this child she's just bad tempered <laughs> you're, you're, she and spoiled so this was at one of the stages when we lived on the farm and uh, mother had to pump the water into the house into a pail and carry it into the house and I pulled one of my bad spells and um, she had had just exactly enough. And so she, and she happened to have a, a bucket of cold water in her hands. Well, <laughs> and she just threw it on me. <laughs> and I was so shocked that, that I stopped. <laughs> I never had another temper tantrum. <laughs> well, that cured you. <laughs> It was instant cure. <laughs> yeah. Did you like growing up on a farm? I've always liked uh, animals. And yes, I like that about a farm. But yeah. uh, in, in a little town like Hugo, you were so close to farms mm -hmm. that um, you often, dad had a farm there. That was during his uh, pecan tree stage. Yeah. And he planted, he, his plan was to plant pecan trees and have them grafted. Yeah. First to buy bottom land, which he did. And bottom land is the area that floods regularly from rivers. Yeah. And, and leaves silt. And so it brings in enriching soil every year. So it's rich soil, yeah. but you're going to get flooded quite often. So he planted his pecan trees, um, oh, hun several hundred of them. And uh, I can remember the county agent came out and, and grafted them for him with, to, so that the trees would produce big paper shell pecans, which are, were much desired. Yeah. They're easier to shell and more beautiful to look at and mighty good deed. Yeah. Well, then he got the idea that what he should do to, is to utilize the grass that would grow up between the, the saplings. And so he bought um, cattle, Guernsey cattle, milk cows from the north that came in by freight. I can remember they arrived on the train and um, we had to go down and unload several milk cows. I don't remember how many. And this was because he wanted ultimately to raise beef cattle. Yeah. The, the milk cows would, could um, nurse two calves each year instead of just one calf. Yeah. So the, the 
the cat, the cows would be bred and uh, what uh, to Hereford stock. So he was actually making a cross between, I believe these were Guernsey cattle and, and the uh, white faced Herefords. And um, it just went along swimmingly, except that the mature cows the, that came down wanted to scratch their backs. <laughs> so they would rub the trees and they would rub them, so, these little saplings, they would rub them so hard, they'd rub the bark off. Oh, no. <laughs> and the sapling wouldn't survive. <laughs> so, that was one of his farming ideas that s sounds good on paper, but it just didn't work in reality. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So we went, these were, these were times when everybody was trying to figure out how to ensure that they would have a, some sort of income stream when they retired. And pensions were not, there were a few pensions with corporations, but not very many. And you sort of had to make your retirement for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it helped your family survive the depression that your dad sold was a traveling salesman during the week. Oh yes. That was, that was the main source of income. And yeah. mother was uh, first with me for 11 years and then with my young brother. So really she raised two only children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and both of us pretty headstrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you have to help out a lot with the farm work? No, I did not. Um, I, I was a town girl, really. Yeah. Uh, the The farm work that I helped out with was I dad gave me a, a black mare mm -hmm. for my 12th birthday. And this she was an elegant animal. Um, she was saddle gated which is, a, she was just for riding, not for working. She was a quarter horse. Yeah. Uh, she was a saddle, a saddle mare, saddle horse, and American saddle horse. And uh, we kept her in a lot. Uh, Dad could rent a vacant lot with a little shed on it for a barn to store food. And we usually rented that by the month from somebody in town. And I kept her in town all spring, summer, and fall. And then it got cold uh, around the holiday time. He, he had the farm where I could take the uh, take her out there and the um, caretaker out there would feed her during the winter and, and I could exercise her when the weather was good. Yeah. But um, anyway, that, that was my friend Nellie. <laughs> I loved... Nellie, I told her every secret in the world, and she she didn't she never did tell on me. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> I can I can remember when I got word that one of my grandparents had died. I can remember hugging that horse and hanging on to her neck and and just crying into her mane, and yeah. uh, she would just patiently stand there. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, she was a lovely animal, and she instinctively knew that when I was on her, she was to look after me. We were a team, and, and occasionally she she didn't she never bucked me off, but occasionally she would shy when we were riding, and I wasn't um, nimble enough to move with her, and so I'd fall. <laughs> and when that happened, she always stopped and dropped the reins over her head out to the ground and just waited for me to get back on. <laughs> yeah. she, she was a lovely animal, but if a man got on her to ride her, she pranced and showed off. She bowed her neck and she stemmed her gates and she <laughs> was high spirited. She was a highly intelligent animal. I loved that horse. <laughs> And later on, when I was grown and had left home and had children of my own, I, I saw her, a little girl riding her in, the, in my old neighborhood. But this time we moved to Durant, and that's where she was sold. And I was, because I was gone and there was nobody using her, 
And this horse must have been at that point at least a quarter of a century old, but mm -hmm. she still had that personality. And I stopped her and petted her, and and uh, it was a loving reunion. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's sweet. <laughs> yeah. So, when was the first time that you realized um, that things were starting to get better as? the depression was ending and um, things I were get, I guess um, my family felt more secure. Yeah. Um, um, when I had had two years of college, we had moved to Durant so that I could um, stay at home and go to college. Yeah. I couldn't uh, at that point. So I went to Southeastern Teachers College. Yeah. State Teachers College. And um, for two years, and then they felt they could afford for me to go to choose one of the state universities and finish, which is the way I did it. Yeah. And uh, so I think it was in that time that I realized there finally was some disposable income in the family. Yeah. Um, but it, what... Uh, Education came first with them because neither my mother nor my father had been able to go to college. Yeah. And, um, that's another long story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we have time to do it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was due uh, in my father's case. He was one of eight children uh, yeah. who was brought up on a hard scrabble farm here in Northwestern Arkansas, yeah, uh, just south of, of Fort Smith, actually, and um, the there were, I believe there were five, there were four boys and five girls, and four of the five girls, my grandmother insisted on helping uh, to go to uh, get degrees at, uh, at University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, yeah. But the boys, there was a, a cold seam on the farm. And so the young men in the area were not encouraged to go to college. They were encouraged to go into the mine, and mine, which my dad hated. So it wasn't long before he decided he'd rather be a salesman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I found it interesting that, that my little farming grandmother thought it, found it more important to educate her girls at that time yeah. than her boys. I guess she felt that the men could make their way, but the girls were <laughs> going to have to have extra help. Yeah. And did you say that they went to, um, to become teachers? All of them were teachers. Yes. Okay. Uh, all but one. And she, I, there's one that, whose degree I'm not sure about, but the, yes, the rest were teachers, art teacher and, and um, home economics teacher and and just general um, public school educators, and they this was this was their life. You know, women did not have very many men to choose from right after World War II, when when those women would have come into maturity about twenty. Yeah. There were so many men killed in war in in the war. I mean, World War One. There were so many men killed when the, uh, in the war that uh, there weren't any bachelor, very many eligible bachelors for them yeah. to choose from. So marriage was not an option. Um, they were not very social. They'd grown up on the farm. And um, my grandmother insisted that, that they have an education. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell me a little bit about your grandparents and how they were raised? In the story that you sent me, I believe you said one of them lived in a two-room log cabin for a while. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> that is my, my Arkansas branch of the family, my father's side, the vineyards. Yeah. Um, they were part of the uh, two brothers came out from... I believe uh, the Carolinas and Virginia yeah. settled uh, this little farm. My um, 
one on each side of the mountain, which I'll tell you about later. That's important. But um, yes, my grandmother um, told the story of of seeing a stranger coming down the road toward the house mm-hmm. up to their cabin. This is when they were back east. Yeah. And she ran in the house and said, Mother, quick, get to the gun. There's some there's a strange man out on the road. So grandmother got the gun, but she um, uh, began to look at the man and she said to her, Honey, that's your daddy coming home from the war. Oh, wow. <laughs> the Civil War. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was after the Civil War that um, the, she, that, that my great grandmother grew up, of course, and married. Um, she was a Davis and she married um, William Vineyard and they moved west looking for better land. That was always everybody's dream of in those days. And um, from they didn't like where they were living in Fort Smith. There's, I don't know what the situation was or Sebastian County. So they took a, a covered wagon, their supplies, and about, I think, uh, six of the children, seven of eight children that survived um and my she was pregnant with my my father yeah and they started down the western side of arkansas through the ozarks headed for texas east texas that was the place because uh, of the farmland down there that they thought was going to be available took all their sold everything they had so they could have some cash money yeah and um, down very near where I live now, within 40 miles, um, my dad was born in that covered wagon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they went on. <laughs> so with seven, seven children and uh, went on to East Texas. And when they got down there, the um, the good land had already been bought up. And uh, and cleared, and the land that was left was um, where they had grown pine trees, and you, they had to be uh, cut, and the stumps were removed before you could farm it. Mm-hmm. My aunt Mitty told me Dad's old, oldest sister remembered it. She said we didn't have the money to buy a team of oxen, and they. It was a team of oxen that was needed to clear stumps. They were strong enough. And our horses were not strong enough. Our team of horses were not strong enough to pull stumps. And so they had to turn around and they went back right where they had, from whence they had started. (laughs) Yeah. And and bought uh, there a a hard scrabble farm that had a cabin on it. And you refer to two rooms. They were good sized rooms, I thought, when I was a little girl. Yeah, how they sh- have shrunk, but it was called uh, a dog trot. Mm-hmm. And today's kids don't know what a dog trot is. It was the way they built cabins in those days: two one rooms, single rooms, yeah, uh, placed parallel to each other, but with a space between them. Yeah, uh, that was kind of porch. And the reason for that, it was a good sized porch. And there was a fireplace at the end of each of those two single cabins, Mm -hmm. but the roof covered all of it. And of course a dog, that was where the dogs liked to sleep in the the (laughs) heat. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. On that porch, because it was covered, they were out of the elements. But so it's a dog trot. Now, Later on, when there was a little cash money available in the family, they put clapboarding mm-hmm. on that and enclosed that and added a big front porch across the front, a veranda. And uh, it made a really, I thought, a, a nice farmhouse, very yeah. comfortable. 
um, it, it, it's, a, it's a plan that I see coming back now in current Southern Living Magazine's <laughs> Lexus. <laughs> Two parallel houses with one covering roof. And it makes some sense because, um, of course, there was no air conditioning. And if um, you can create a convection current by opening openings on the outside of the house and to this cooler porch area so that it would create a, a cooling effect during our hot season. Yeah, that's fascinating. We have a hot season in Arkansas. <laughs> Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> eventually, you... oh, go ahead. Well, eventually, I started to say eventually that log house was stripped down, back down to the logs. Uh-huh could see them around the foundation area. Um, when I went there as a little girl, I didn't know what I was looking at, really. Yeah. One of my cousins did, and so she presented it. She researched the cabin, and it um, became a, a historical cabin that was taken apart and moved into Greenwood, Arkansas, there in their little municipal park. It was the one of the earliest schoolhouses built for them in the state of Arkansas. Yeah, that's fascinating. But it looks so small now. I don't know how she. I don't know how she reared seven children in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it was it was a fun place to visit because it was on the farm. Yeah. And it. Um, Country life and, and the, the cattle and the hogs and the, the uh, outbuildings, one of them of which was doubled for a bathroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that always fascinated me. They, when I went there as a child, they got their water from a well that was uh-huh. in the front yard. And there was this common dipper that, that you just hung up on a peg or a nail right there on the top, on the well struck. And anybody that came along, even down the road, was welcome to <laughs> have water and, and use the common dipper. We I don't think we had germs in those days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't see that today. <laughs> no, you certainly wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what about your mother's side of the family? All right. My mother's side of the family, he was um, um, a policeman for the Frisco Railroad. Yeah. Frisco that came through. uh, Mother was born in Indian Territory. Okay. Eastern Oklahoma. Yeah. And, um, and... um, her roots were around Muskogee and Wagner in that area. And um, when he, when dad and granddad and grandmother married, um, I, I suppose she told him, now look, Will, it's time for you to settle down. So he dis- declared that he was a pharmacist. I don't, I, I don't think pharmacy was, there was no such thing as a license and I doubt if there was even a school of pharmacy. <laughs> <laughs> he was smart. And so he, so he ran a, what amounted to a, a little pharmacy drugstore uh, for a long time and was quite successful at it. They had four children, but he, like the rest of the family, had a wandering streak. And so he wanted to go west. And this would have been in the... Um, let's see, mother was born in 1904. So this would have been uh, when she was about six or eight years old. Yeah. She and her sister, a young family. And grandmother used to, that grandmother used to talk about um, the train trip that she took to Spokane, Washington. He thought he was going to find his fortune in the West. Uh That that was the talk all over this country at that time. Go west, young man, go west. Yeah. Well, it didn't work so well for them. And so they, uh, part of it was that uh, 
again, opportunity that they heard about had already passed. Somebody else had gotten there earlier. And with the limited resources, it was not possible to uh, purchase anything of any, any value, a store or any, anything like that. So then they moved several times, but the last time that I have real knowledge of is they wound up in New Mexico okay. um, homesteading near Raton. Yeah. And there is still a branch of the family that is out there that stayed, but my grandmother just never liked these places. She didn't, she wanted to go back to Oklahoma. Yeah. Eventually they did come back and he bought a little um, neighborhood store and that was their support for the rest of their lives. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to when you started college in the 1940s. Um, so when, what made you decide to go to college and what did you want to do? Uh, I didn't have a whole lot of choices about what I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, and mother and mother was a strange kind of guidance counselor. <laughs> Mine was made up <laughs> what I should do. <laughs> In some ways, I think that's merciful, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> not so many options. So after uh, this was actually, I graduated in in fifty, and okay. then fifty. So this would be the early fifties, and um, women were still expecting that they would marry and be homemakers. There were not a lot of options open. Uh, teaching, which I didn't want to do, and nursing were acceptable uh, occupations for women. And yeah. I knew I didn't want to be a nurse. I didn't like the sight of blood. <laughs> so um, it was not really my option, but she where I wanted to go to college when they there finally was were funds so that I could go to a state college and that meant just two choices Oklahoma A and M and Oklahoma University and um, I didn't base it on anything except that my best friend had, was going to Oklahoma A and M yeah so I I said well I think I'll take A and M well uh -huh. she said. Uh, they're good at home economics. That's what you'll major in. <laughs> <laughs> in looking back on it, um, with today's child and my background, I had been a college debater at Southeastern under a very famous debate coach. Yeah. I could well have continued along that line and become an, um, gone to law school. Oh, wow. But that was not an option. Um, graduate training was not an option. You were lucky if you could get a bachelor's degree. Yeah. Of my bachelor's of science and home economics. But it was not a wrong choice at all because I have used that degree in one way or another every day of my life. Yeah. So, so what, uh, what more to recommend it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you ever regret not being able to Get, go to law school or did you even think about that since it just I didn't even think about it and there was another reason there were there were really very few women lawyers we had a good one in Durant we were living there by that time but she was a spinster I didn't want to be a spinster and um, she was not my idea of a particularly happy woman yeah I did it was not an option that women took up. It was kind of a rough sport. <laughs> yeah. So the idea of feminism hadn't really occurred to any of us yet, I think. Yeah. And when I, by the time I graduated in 50, I wanted to get married and I had met the man of my dreams uh -huh. to have a very happy married for 64 years so who could who could say that was a wrong choice I don't think it was yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so you got your pilot's license though while you were at college in Durant didn't you and yes yes I did no in high school 
Oh, um, okay. my senior year in high school, we moved to Durant so that I could go to college there yeah. at Southeastern. But that senior year, uh, they offered a, a flight training to a boy and a girl who would apply for it. And no, none of the other girls wanted it. Yeah. And so I applied. And I, was, I had taken um, aviation instead, <laughs> instead of physics <laughs> <laughs> because I thought it was easier. <laughs> so I was, I was well-placed for that. And I did get my private license. Yeah. Uh, as it was issued as soon as I was 18. I had to wait several months for it. <laughs> yeah. And I learned to fly and thought it was fun. But again, the same situation um, of women's expectations in those days. Yeah. After uh, those were free lessons and good ones, but expensive ones. Yeah. And I really didn't have the money to continue to uh, rent planes and fly for, for pleasure. Yeah. And, um, and, the waves, particularly, and the, um, during World War II, we're beginning to appreciate the fact that there were women flyers, quite a number of them. Yeah. And they flew for the government delivering planes. They were not allowed to fly in combat, yeah. but delivered planes all over this country and to England. Yeah. Uh, which was combat, <laughs> actually. <laughs> being bombed, but um, those women came back and whatever opportunities there were for women in aviation were of course going to go to them, justly so. Yeah. But there were this small cadre of very well trained and exper flight trained and experienced um, women aviators. So that was not really an option for somebody to start in and it didn't look like a promising career. Yeah. Were you, yeah. were you the only female in your um, flight classes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Was that and, a strange uh, experience? Or? I don't remember that it was different. And <laughs> yeah. that, is something, that is something that is um, that I think about today. We, the, the society just sort of divided what was appropriate for women. And what was not appropriate, and we didn't I, uh, didn't think too much about it. Really, didn't study it. it that's just the way things were. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> so, so for a calm girl, it was it was it was comfortable. I I had met delightful people doing interesting things. So, yeah. <laughs> Don. <Moved on. laughs> I what really was it it like? was, oh, go ahead. I was going to say it was an expensive hobby, even in those days. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like moving to OSU? Because um, Durant's quite a ways away from Stillwater. Um, no, I didn't find it so. I, I was I was a Greek. Um, yeah, went through rush. Uh, the thing I do remember was that it, that was really exciting. Because I, uh, mother and and my best friend's mother took us to Dallas to Neiman's to get our wardrobe. Ah. <laughs> and, and Neiman's, we we have uh, cute little figures that were just exactly uh, suited to Neiman's mezzanine. Mm -hmm. They had wonderful. Uh, dresses for young women. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, <clears throat> that was when I bought a, a marvelous orange red, tomato red dress with a, a swing skirt and um, very simple, very elegant, very bold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the one I caught my husband with. <laughs> How did you guys meet? Oh my! Well, he was um, he was five years older than I. Yeah. And he graduated from West Point um, five five years 
four years pr uh, previously, I guess, three years. And yeah. it was in, had had um, a tour in Korea. His mother and his brother lived across the street from my parents in Durant. Yeah. And uh, John and I were friends, and we still are. John is now 92, and I'm 91. Yeah. He still tries to treat me like a little sister. And I, <laughs> yeah, John is your brother-in-law, right? He's my brother-in-law. Oh, yeah. Dear. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, John introduced us. Okay. Occasionally, I had dated John. Uh, it wasn't ever anything serious, and so had my best friend. And then we'd get behind his back and giggle about it. <laughs> anyway, but John was a, a patient soul. <laughs> And he had sent a photograph of me and told Malcolm that I, about my flying experience and so forth, and that I was the new girl in town. And he really should meet him, meet me when he came home. He came home on leave and um, John introduced us. We went out for Coke. And I remembered that I was so disinterested in meeting him that particular day <laughs> that I wouldn't even change out of my blue jeans. It was Saturday. And so I was allowed to wear blue jeans on Saturday. And <laughs> I, I wouldn't even go, go in the house and comb my hair. <laughs> we went for a Coke and I thought, well, gee, he's kind of interesting. You know, he, he was, he was um, man of the world, had traveled widely in the Orient and was back home. He was in uniform. Oh, he was a, he was a dandy. <laughs> he was a catch. <laughs> and um, apparently he felt the same way. He took me to a concert while he was on leave that time. And he was um, very sweet and surprised me. On our third date, he asked me to marry him. Oh, wow. <laughs> So I came home that night and uh, told mother, I said, mother, you'll never believe what happened tonight. <laughs> I told her and she said, oh, honey, he won't be back. He, you're just the first white woman he's seen in three years. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so that kind of put the kibosh on it for a bit. And uh, we did our our courting by mail, by long distance, because he had to report back to Fort Lewis, Washington. But we had an understanding by the time um, he left. He was among the first troops that were sent to Korea in the, in the Korean action in the early 50s. And um, whatever our plans were, we had to put on hold while he was fighting a war there. And I graduated from college. And again, I'd say I had never really intended to have to have a job. And it just didn't occur to me I would <laughs> need to support myself. Yeah. I was the only degree I was interested in was an MRS. <laughs> <laughs> so here I was. But I did graduate with honors at, at yeah. Oklahoma State University. And uh, it was A&M in those days and um, in home economics. And lo and behold, I got a job in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. <laughs> as editor to the, the um, as secretary to the editor of the, uh, their monthly magazine. Yeah. And she was a young woman who really wasn't a whole lot older than I was. And we. Yeah. A wonderful time together and established a friendship that lasted as long as she lived yeah. and she helped me edit my the cookbooks that I wrote oh, she, wow. she and I worked on a cookbook by the way <laughs> <laughs> so I did the typing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, that was fun for about yeah. six, seven months and then Malcolm was rotated home he'd done his time in Korea yeah we got married that summer. Yeah. What year was that? Oh, that was uh, 1950. Okay. 1950, July the 29th. 
and uh, hot. oh, that was a hot summer. So when you talk about it, about how hot our recent environment has been, it had been 110 degrees actually for the entire month of July, and the church was not air conditioned. Oh my, that must have been miserable. Our friends still talk about the the wedding that took place in a pressure cooker. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> In fact, one of the famous stories of that was that at West Point, uh, when the cadets were on parade, if it was a hot day, um, they were they wore their pajamas underneath their uniforms to keep them sweating through, frankly. <laughs> yeah. So Malcolm had worn his pajamas to the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath, underneath his uniform, and he looked elegant and cool. <laughs> but he sure got a lot of ribbing about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, it, um, it was it, that was an exciting time, and and I had my introduction to being an army wife, and I found out why my independence and my hard-headedness and a few of those things fit into the army life very, very well. Yeah. (laughs) Now your turn. Okay. Where did you guys um, live during your first few years of marriage? Didn't you go to Germany? Yes, we did. Uh, We we were in California. Okay. Um, We started out married life there. Yeah. And, um, And then we went to Georgia for advanced schooling for him in the infantry. And uh, from there, he was assigned to Germany. So um, we traveled separately. Yeah. Uh, there was so little housing in Germany that soon after the war, four or five years after the war. Yeah. And um, so he had to go ahead of us. By this time we had little Katie. Yeah. Our, friend, our oldest child. Yeah. And she was a toddler. And she and I traveled then on um, one of the old troop ships, actually, to Germany, from New York to Germany, and ran into a terrible storm at sea just off the southern tip of England. Yeah. And where the, the channel currents meet the Atlantic currents. Mm-hmm. And, um, bad weather, besides. So it was a rough trip. The kid, the little kids on board, mostly wives and children on that ship. And uh, they were sick the whole way. (laughs) It was was not, it was not sailing as you imagine it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, we were in Germany um, three years and um, uh, Katie was about three years old, I guess, when we went over. And we had wanted a bigger family very much. And one of the pivotal moments of my life was um, when I went into the army hospital in Frankfurt mm-hmm. for, to find out why I just did not get pregnant a second time, what yeah. the problem was. And I met a uh, there was a big sign hanging there. If you refuse treatment from any of our doctors, you will not be seen at a U.S. military or army hospital. Yeah. And I didn't really un- understand what I was reading, but the yeah. gynecologist, uh, when he came in to examine me, was a black man. Yeah. And. I, it was for a Southern girl, that was a real turning point. Are you going to refuse treatment or, or, or do you want this baby or another baby bad enough to find out what the problem is? Yeah. He was so kind and so intellectual, so professional and so interested in my, in me that he soon found out what the problem was. And I had two children during those three years that I was in Germany. That, yeah. finished, our, that finished our family. But um, I, I, any t- time that 
I have, um, well, I should say this, integration between the races was forced uh, by decree in the army. It was the first place that uh, it was uh, the rule and there were no questions asked. Yeah. And that was a learning curve for me. I've still got some little spots of my Southern heritage, but uh, I've learned so much. And some of the most wonderful people have been very different for me. Yeah. And so to notice a difference does not require value judgment. Yeah. I've, I've really tried to live up to that. Yeah. <laughs> you remember, so you grew up in Oklahoma, you know, um, do you remember any interactions with people of a different race to you, Native American or African American people? Yes, um, in, in Eastern Oklahoma, um, well, in Hugo, there, yeah. there was actually, there was a separate area of town where the blacks lived, but they worked, of course, any place that uh, over on the white section. So yeah. whatever relationships we had, I know now were paternal, but they were also very loving. Yeah. Um, I particularly remember the, the mother didn't have help on a regular basis, but she did have a washerwoman. Yeah. Joe Alice and Joe Alice helped mother when uh, uh, my little brother came along. Yeah. Um, and they were every relationship that I had with uh, blacks was at its basis uh, based on respect and love. Yeah. And so I grew up um separately but but i didn't have anything anything to overcome it was just a fact of life we had um a number of indians but not like northeastern oklahoma not yeah. near as many and ours were choctaw yeah but but a federal judge uh, was chief of the choctaw nation and he lived just a few blocks away so there was he was greatly respected yeah. Um, and other than that, it was a very segregated way to grow up, but there was no friction about it at that time. Yeah. It was just the way it was. It was just the way it was. And a, a little girl doesn't really spend a lot of time thinking about those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you remember a time when that started to change or did it ever change? The, you the army helped me change. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it was by decree, and and if you um, registered any, if, if you uh, the women, even the wives were not allowed to voice any uh, any social statements about uh, other people. Yeah, it was really they were just. And, and the, I will say we have had some outstanding, as a result, some outstanding black officers in the officer group, in the general officer group. So uh, they were, um, it, it can be done. It can be forced, but then it can become natural. Yeah. <laughs> So moving back to when you were in Germany, you mentioned it was really hard to find housing right after the war. Did you notice what was life like for people there who were recovering from? Well, that's an interesting thing, a, a little trick of history. The, um, Germany was divided into the British zone, the French zone, and the American zone. Yeah. Um, they, the French, um, we, we were stationed in the French zone. Yeah. And the French, of course, have been uh, enemies with the Germans for so many years that neither trusted the other at all. 
there was some recovery taking place in the American zone, in the British zone. In the French zone, nobody would do anything to rebuild. So it was about four years after the end of the war when I got there. And they nobody had even picked up any of the rubble from the bombings. Mm. People were living in the inside bombed out buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the French didn't want to give the Germans anything, any help. The yeah. Germans didn't want to build anything that the French might get back mm. before the peace treaty was signed. And so yeah. it, was, it was in exactly the same shape as it was when the bombers left the sky. Uh, mm. And it was very hard on German people and Americans, and they didn't really, the Germans did not like Americans in there at all. And we are kind of a brash sort of people, but I think we're pretty nice <laughs> in the long yeah. run. <laughs> they didn't think so. Yeah. So it, it was it was a beautiful country, but there were they had, they had many many problems when I left that didn't really change over the three years I was there. Yeah. So what did you guys do when you came back to the states? We came back to. Um, Oklahoma A and M. <laughs> <laughs> Mac came back as an, uh, uh, an assistant professor, I guess. Yeah. I don't remember his title. Those titles weren't important to me. The mil I understood the military rank. I never did understand the <laughs> professorial <laughs> rank. <laughs> but anyway, we came back with with three little children and a big boxer dog, and. Um, Mac wanted to come back because a friend of his was was the um, head of the military yeah. RTC there, and he would allow his men to, to. It was arranged ahead of time that Mac could go back and get his master's degree, yeah, outside, which he did. It took four years, but he he got his master's in industrial engineering and management there. Okay, and there was a big push in the military and the officer corps that. Um, Everybody needed a graduate degree. Yeah. And I got my teaching degree, and you heard me say I never really wanted to teach, but I had learned that home economists are so healthy that they just never die off and leave a, a, a <laughs> teaching degree. <laughs> and I had, I had despaired that I would ever get to teach home economics. So I took a teaching, uh, the certification for elementary school, which I did for quite some time yeah. and found it very rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> did you teach in Stillwater? No, I didn't. I, I did my, I did my um, certification and that, that's a kind of a funny story. I had been a, a, a four point student in college, in college really too easy for me and um, in my undergraduate days, but I came back and b by the six week period, I was flunking. I, I was trying to take 13 hours in one semester with three little kids. The oldest yeah. one was five. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so, yeah, pretty rough. Uh, and I, I had to go see the Dean about my grades. I was failing. Yeah. And I, I just had never failed at anything in college. Couldn't believe it was happening to me. And I had a cold besides, a head cold. Oh, no. I just was thoroughly miserable. And he said, well, Mrs. McDonald, what do you think is the problem with your studying? And I, I reached into my coat pocket to get a Kleenex, but instead I brought out this handful of little kids' socks. <laughs> And I, and I just threw him on the desk and said, well, this is the problem. <laughs> he gave me another chance and I settled down and, and I did survive that semester of 13 hours and get my teaching credentials, but I, for primary elementary school, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I certainly did not cover myself with glory. <laughs> I found it a useful tool. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> well, it sounds like in your in the 
thing that you sent me that you moved around a lot. Yes. So, so from Stillwater, then we moved to Arizona mm -hmm. and that sent him back to uh, Kansas to Fort Leavenworth for more advanced schooling. And we went there for a winter and then back to Arizona and then to Japan. Yeah. And I like to, th I, I like to think that uh, about the years in Japan, because that was, I think my favorite place in, that we ever were assigned. Yeah. Um, I learned more there, but yeah. I, it was, it, by that time I had my life a little bit under control, not much, but with three little youngsters, but they were old enough to like to travel and they were interesting and, um, Japan is a, was a fascinating country. It's still, um, I learned how you survive when you're crowded in small spaces. I learned, and that's the reason for the very elaborate etiquette rules that they had, I presume still do have. Yeah. Um, everybody knows his position and what he is expected of him. And therefore, they're, when they're not surprises, you have time to accommodate them. Yeah. Um, I, they have a wonderful art sensibility that pleased me, that I, I enjoyed so much. To, and I had time to do some of these things. I taught there, elementary school. Yeah. But this gave us a little extra funds and a little leg up on some sa a savings account, which we'd never been able to have. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and um, I love that. Then back to Washington from there. And then an yeah. awful lot of moving around that I still find kind of aimless, trying to find our way as civilians. Yeah. The Vietnam War was a tragedy for the whole country, mm -hmm. but it's a personal tragedy for us. So. Yeah. But, and you said your husband the way I understand it, your husband left the army because of the Vietnam War. Yes. Correct? Yeah. Yes. His, um, when we were in Japan, we had watched the casualties coming back from Vietnam to the hospitals um, there in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, we knew what was going on. My husband at that time was in, in a signal intelligence yeah. so we knew what was happening and we uh he was a quite a military historian and he concluded that if the french could not win a war in end of china with their very professional army and it was a good army yeah um, that the united states would not be able to win a civil war there and that it was, in fact, a civil war, and we should not be in it. And so we tried to get the attention of our senators um, and congressmen from Oklahoma at the time, and that was Carl Albert, um, yeah. uh, um, who was Speaker of the House. We sent letters, now, Mac dictated them and I typed them and yeah. but I signed them he did not sign them because the military uh flags an officer's record if he's seen to be communicating with the politicians mm -hmm. the federal politicians uh or complaining so yeah. <laughs> we knew it would have ended his career if he had spoken up mm -hmm. and military at that time were as compliant as they seem to be right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> but the bottom line was he felt he no. was going to send, that he couldn't in conscience send a young man to fight a war that was not winnable. Yeah. 
we left and tried to be civilians, but we never made very good civilians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I have. I've, I've made my peace with it, but I don't think he ever quite did, but he didn't complain. And, and um, yeah, left at a time of very full employment when jobs were available. Mm-hmm. And he did have a master's degree in, in uh, management. Yeah. So he... He was offered good jobs and had good opportunities. Yeah. But we... So, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't understand why we needed to move so much. That was one thing I wanted my kids to be in school. Um, the middle child, Nancy, was in 13 schools before she graduated <laughs> high school. <laughs> That's an awful lot. <laughs> that is an awful lot. Yeah. So the kids became... Um, very flexible Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, but in their adult lives, they have hated moving. And so, so have I for that matter. That's why I've been right here in this house for 36 years. (laughs) (laughs) I understand. (laughs) I, I, I've, I've said the sight of an Atlas moving van going down the street just makes me nauseous. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So let's talk about your your cookbooks. What prompted you to write those? Well, when I came to Arkansas, um, I thought, what in the world am I going to do? We were retiring, and I was only 53 then, and Mac was older. He was 65. His job left him, and my job left me about the same time in Chicago. And uh, I thought, what am I going to do? Sitting on a lake in Arkansas? in the wild, <laughs> find something to do. What do I know? And I thought, this is my time to, to write. And that is a message I'd like to leave all you young women in the world with. Um, so often I, I had had to put off the things that I really wanted to do in favor of the things that needed to be done. And that didn't hurt. I don't re- begrudge that at all. But I'd always wanted to write. I'd been editor of the high school newspaper and had um, written copious letters back describing the areas we were visiting and traveling in. And then uh, by the time we came down here, there were no more children living at home. And about the first, almost the first decade of retirement, uh, we still had two or three parents living in Oklahoma, Durant. Yeah. And so we'd taken care of them. And in other words, our responsibilities that life just puts on you are, they were met. And we felt like we, I felt like I had time to do what I wanted to do. And I'd always wanted time to write. So what do I know? Well, not a whole lot, but what I do know is a lot about food. And <laughs> All those years of traveling, we entertained a lot in the army, and and uh, and good food and good um, food practices because of my home economic training. Yeah, and I always tried to cook the recipes that my family had had. It was an effort to give the kids a, a feeling of of roots somewhere. Yeah. And those recipes, the very best ones, were invariably, they would start out with Aunt Susan's recipe for uh, brown candy, for instance, yeah. it's a favorite, and um, Aunt Susan's toffee recipe. And at holiday time, we used a lot of Aunt Susan's recipes, and I really didn't know who she was, uh-huh. uh, other than I had a lot of recipes from her. <laughs> I began to ask my mother's friends about her and discovered that that was a pen name for the food editor at the Daily Oklahoma newspaper back during the uh, 20s and 30s. Yeah. And she she was the one that taught my mother's whole generation how to cook in Oklahoma. Yeah. And so I did the research because that took a lot of time. I had great patience with it. Yeah. And um, the result was this first little cookbook can you okay am i holding it so you can see it yeah okay long lost recipes of aunt susan 
And says, okay, long lost recipes because nobody seemed to know anything about her anymore. <laughs> and we do that. I yeah. wrote a little cookbook. And then I found a very interesting woman who, um, Aunt Susan was Edna Vance Mueller, Adams Mueller. And um, it was a pen name for her. But she was really very famous um, in Oklahoma. She was probably one of the country's earliest celebrity chefs. Ah. Um, she, she wrote five columns a, a day, uh, a week for the Daily Oklahoman uh -huh. with recipes. And then sometimes there would be a column of things that were just uh, going on in Oklahoma contemporaneously when she was writing for them. Yeah. And so the book is, that's the reason for the book's layout. Okay. Uh, the columns over, over on this side right here. Um, yeah. The, the date that she wrote the column and published it. And it was a, has a lot of hints in there for how women coped uh, during the Depression and the Dust Bowl days. Yeah. So she, she had quite a career. And then after she left Oklahoma City, she broadcast over WKY five times a week. Yeah. After she left, she became the food editor of McCall's Magazine oh. and was the editor-in-chief of the Betty Crocker School of the Air. And that was sometimes on radio, but she yeah. was beginning to delve into using television. Yeah. She beat Julia Childs to television by about five or 10 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, she was, she was quite a, quite a gal yeah. with quite, quite an interesting and a slightly scandalous uh, background, but uh, fun to read about. Yeah. <laughs> and that book was very successful on that. And then it was followed by a second cookbook not as successful. This, this one, the little black and white book sold 5,000 copies the first week. Oh, wow. So people remembered Aunt Susan then and were uh -huh. interested in it. This one has more of her recipes, but um, it has the, the wit of Will Rogers giving you a man's viewpoint for the same period of time. Are you okay? Yeah. 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 Those were two self-published books that together, and the, my third one then, I'll have to reach it. Excuse me. Is the best from Helen Corbett's Kitchens. And Helen Corbett now it was a Texan, um, a New Yorker turned Texan, uh -huh. who uh, this little book, she was, she taught my generation how to cook and what was acceptable in etiquette and how to entertain. Whereas the two older books that I did, uh, the Oklahoma books were for my mother's generation. So it was just yeah. kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Altogether, I guess I have sold somewhere around 80,000 copies. Oh, wow. Of the three books. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yes, that is, that is. That was quite an accomplishment. It was a hobby ran, that ran amok. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Well, is there anything else that you would like to add as we end our time together? No, I think we've pretty well covered most things. Yeah. Uh, except for this. I was mentioning that this was a period of time when I was writing uh, when I could do what I wanted to do. So I say to every woman as she comes into her 60s, or maybe 50s if you're fortunate, uh, when, the, when the bills are paid and you can, you're comfortable, you have done most of the things that the world expects of you or demands of you, remember you have a time that is very, very valuable. It was the most productive years uh, time in my life, the 60, when I was 60 and on up to 70, got energy. Uh, today's modern woman, if she's in good health, has a long life ahead of her. Mm -hmm. And it's time to be good to yourself. 
and you can be with a clear conscience and do what <laughs> you want to do. <laughs> That's great advice. I like that. <laughs> good place. Good place to end. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording if that's okay. That's fine.